And once we figure out how to change the setup. All right. Did he show you how to change? Oh, absolutely. Good to see you. Do you know how to change this? Oh, yeah, you're all set. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, wherever, whoever's. <laughs> They're sneaky in the back. So um, Siddhi Chen is an assistant professor in genetics. He's uh, one of the leaders and first people to have done uh, in vivo uh, CRISPR screens uh, and is an expert on a, a large variety of different genomic approaches uh, from CRISPR also into CAR-Ts and things like that. And we'll let uh, Siddhi give his talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. Uh, today, I would like to describe to you the, some of the basic research in my lab. Briefly, some of the uh, old stories and primarily on the two new stories that we published this year. So uh, in brief, we would like to introduce you the next generation uh, tumor modeling and genetic screening, and then the genetic interaction in cancer and how do we use gene editing for immune engineering. So why is, why is tumor modeling important? Because we have a large data set now, cancer genomics from patients, thousands and thousands of them, and keep accumulating from the hospital. And this will become a routine, or in the very near future, I believe it's gonna become routine to take patient biopsy and sequence them and figure out what are the mutations. And we have accumulating cancer types with mutations, copy number, transcriptome, and phenome, and the epigenome data, and even trans, a single cell transcriptomics. So, but with this giant and massive data set, we know there are some AI algorithm uh, there, but how can we definitively prove some of those mutations are actually necessary or sufficient to drive diseases? And because there are so many genes, how do we know which of the two genes or three genes interact together to drive the phenotype of cancer? And exactly what do these new mutations do? For example, two of the beautiful cases that the, the last speaker just spoke about, those are novel mutation no one know like no one know what they do before and if a patient have those mutation or if uh, a new patient coming in and have the same mutation do we know what they do and how do they drive the tumor progression in a native tumor mic environment under immune pressure and with that we would like to introduce the next generation tool for us to be able to map the genome to the phenome for cancer mutations like we how about we just do everything together in the animals and then prove that these are the mutations that are driving cancer and those are the ones that are not. And with that, we were hoping to achieve a clinical actionable map in the future. This is my vision. And two of the approach we're trying to, to, to address these questions are, one is the functional map of cancer genome drivers by directly taking cancer patients' mutations, for example, uh, the ones being sequenced, and then we just generate the exact same mutation in the animal and see how those drive cancer. And uh, the other approach is to use unbiased geno genome discovery, meaning we scan the entire genome and see what would happen. And then we'll see if those are the mutations driving cancer and if those are the mutations that are also mutated in the patient. And one thing we did is the, we invented the direct in vivo CRISPR screen or autophonous genetic screen where we would take the, the, the virus or such as AV or lentivirus or other viral vectors and we directly mutagenize the right organs in vivo. This can be the brain, the lung, the, 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 the liver and the pancreas and other organs. And then when those and then when those organs containing the cells of origin were mutated, then you see tumors growing because you hit the tumor suppressors or oncogenes, for example, the uh, KRAS P53 in the lung, they will drive the cancer in the lung, and then NF1 P10, that will drive cancer in the brain. And then all we need to do is to capture sequence the, all of the tumors, including the big ones and small ones in the pool, and then we'll figure out what are the drivers, what are the, the, the passengers. And the first case we did this is glioblastoma, and this is also the first case done by TCGA in 2008, and then uh, later on 2013 and 2016. This is very deadly cancer and a lot of mutations. And, and then what we try to do is we take these mutations and then we 
synthesize the guide RNA library, we put them into a viral vector, and then we deliver the viral vector into the lateral ventricle or the hippocampus of the brain. And then what we did is we followed survival to imaging and histology and pathology analysis. And these were led by two of my, two of my students, one of my postdocs, and that was published uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, the take home message is that if you have a normal brain and that got hit by a pool virus that is capable of mutagenesis, and that virus is going to generate tumor. And that's close to 100% of the time penetrance. All the animals would fall off. And of course, during a long time frame, and then with the different pensions. And these mice would develop glioblastoma, which is mimicking the clinical feature. And then, but this is complex pool. There are a lot of mutations in the brain. Like one of these brain tumors can contain dozens or to hundreds of mutations. And then what we did is we capture sequence all the, the, the targeted loci that's cut by the guide RNA. And those can contain insertions, deletions, splicing, side mutations, just like what uh, you sequence from the patient. But we are doing a simple experiment, recapitulating nature, and we are able to, to capture the entire mutanome in, uh, in the glioblastoma that's driving directly the tumor growth and progression in these mice. And then with that, we are able to one-shot generate a functional analysis of GBM. And, to, and then we compare this functional analysis in animals and to the TCGA data again, and then to our Yale glioma center or the GBM patient data, and then we see there's a uh, significant correlation suggesting the functional ones are still the functional ones. But there are a few outliers that we'd like to point out. For example, the beta-2 microglobulin, which is highly mutated in the, in the animals, but not so highly mutated in the patient tumor, in, for example, in the Yale uh, patient cohort. But uh, or there are sporadic uh, case reporting suggesting HLA is also mutated in the glioblastoma. So that would give us an additional confidence. But how many of those are sufficient to drive a glioblastoma? And what we did is, in fact, taking some of the co-mutated ones and we just knock out two genes or three genes and see if they are sufficient to drive glioblastoma. And then, as you can see, if we knock out NF1 and ML3, two genes are sufficient to give you a glioblastoma, even though that's only 40%. And then uh, likewise, if you knock out P10, that's 100% penetrance. And beta-2 microglobulin and NF1, that's uh, four out of five, this is 80% penetrance. So a small number of genes are sufficient, but of course, more genes will drive the cancer being more aggressive. Uh, long story short, we similarly mapped the functional atlas in the hepatocellular carcinoma using similar approach but with uh, a different viral vector called AAV8 carrying the, uh, the TBG promoter, which is specific to hepatocytes. And what we did is we delivered intravenously into the, the tail vein of the animal, and that would mostly home to the, the liver, and then the TBG promoter can drive the liver-specific expression. And then the MRI imaging shows that the mice develop uh, a liver cancer, and those are GRP positive because the, they were driven by the, the gene editing, and that also turned on GFP. And the mice die, and the histology shows that this mimics the, the liver cancer. And then we generate a map of the liver cancer by sequencing the entire the liver, five lobes of each animal. And then we map out the liver cancer, a mutano, functional mutanome. So we're scaling this up to the entire genome, but now using different uh, genetic background. For example, uh, all the, those previous experiments we did were baseline, or meaning unsensitized. What we are doing now is using the MIG oncogene to sensitize the uh, tumor genesis. So looking for secondary mutations that are making the tumors to, to grow on top of MIG. And then we also have a P53 knockout metagenized, a sensitized, and the PI3K activates and sensitized. And we basically what we need to do is repeat the experiment with the genome scale library because we have a sensitizing mutation. So that, in that way, we can pick up a lot of things that are more subtle, like we don't have to have the driver that's actually needed to, to drive the tumor. But we can look for modifiers, such as the, in this experiment we did for liver cancer. And what we did is we, we have the MIG prime, P53 prime, and PI3K prime uh, tumor types. And then we sequence those mice, and then in the whole genome scale, we identify a few interesting secondary modifiers like KDM6B, GTF2E2, and uh, the and a few other genes that we are uh, less uh, we, we know less about, and we actually characterizing this. 
And the same approach can be done using a lung cancer model where the, the tumor were primed by a KRAS mutation. And what we did is using AV9 and use capture the delivered virus into the lung. And what we saw is the actual tumor formation in the lung. And these are GFP and green nodules. And we likewise, we sequence those uh, lung to see uh, what mutations are there. And again, we, we found the RAP20A, U2AF, Rho, and Smoothen, and those mutations are actually the, the secondary modifier of KRAS in driving lung cancer oncogenesis. So with that, we like to uh, quickly wrap up the, the story for the functional genome analysis mapping for physician oncology using germs. And uh, we would like to make these germs available and then use them as pu putative personal avatars because in the future you can take a patient's mutation rather than the entire cohort's mutation. For example, a patient has five mutations, you can just make those models in the animals and, and test what drugs are um, uh, most resistant in these models and what drugs are most sensitive. And, and, and that can potentially give some information to the clinicians to, 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 to consider. And, and, and then uh, more recently, we uh, completed a sensitized screen for cancer immune scape in vivo. What we did is we used a liver cancer model with the P53 mic driven uh, oncogenesis. And then we throw in the breed library, and then we found that this breed library metagenized the, the, uh, these cancer cells pretty quickly and then make them more aggressive in uh, growing in various type of uh, in, uh, host. And what we sequenced later on is that we, we sequenced the guys and we found the ones that have been enriched. And then one of the genes that we are interested in following is the PARC1A, which is less well characterized. And what makes us more intrigued about this gene is that it not only makes the tumor being, able, uh, being capable of growing out from the new mice, but also make the, the mutants capable of growing out in B6 mice. And while even the APC or TSC2 or like, CSNK1A, those strong tumor suppressors, the, the, they couldn't make the, the mic PVV cell line to grow in B6. So that's one out of the four comparison out of the 20,000 in the gene. And then what we did is uh, mass back because the part one a is a, uh, upstream of PKA. So we hypothesized it must change some type of uh, the, the proteome or the phosphorylation signaling. And our mass spec data shows us that the a PARC one a hits IWS1 and LIMCH1, and IWS1 is interacting with SETB2 in regulating gene expression. So with long story short, we then look at the gene expression by RNA-seq, and what we found is a dramatic change in gene expression by just losing one gene, which is PARC one a And the most striking signature are two. One is extracellular matrices, and the other is inflammatory responses, suggesting that one change in the tumor cells change the uh, ability of the cancer cells to modulate the, the, the tumor microenvironment. And, and that's exactly true. We also did single cell RNA sequencing and look for the uh, tumor infiltrating uh, immune cells. And what we found is actually the uh, myeloid population and the TAM population being changed most significantly. And then we use flow to validate some of those findings and we hone into the two populations, MMDSCs and PNM MDSCs being most dramatically changed upon loss of PROC1A in the tumor cells. And that would give, uh, our hypothesis is that that changed the, the, the secreted, signature, uh, secreted proteins and the extracellular matrices that are altering the signaling between the, the tumor recruitment of the myeloid population such as MDSCs. So I like to slightly switch gear from oncogenesis to metastasis because metastases are the ones that kill patients rather than the primary tumor where we have very good surgeons down here who can take out virtually all the tumor you can see. But metastasis make a tumor become a, a systemic disease and disable surgery or radiation options and, and metastases can be rapidly evolving. But we know genetic interaction networks governing metastasis because the search for single gene controlling metastasis is, uh, is successful, but not quite as what we expected. But the genetic interaction can be highly complicated uh, rather than the con canonical view of uh, sig the single pathway signaling of PI3K, AKTM, or RAS, RAF, uh, Merck. Merck. We believe uh, in, as a systems the geneticist, the, the interactions in our genome is look like this. It's a big hairy ball. So how can we tease this out? We need better tools. So what we later on trying to 
leverage is called a CPF1 enzyme. And that enzyme has a great advantage, which is first invented by uh, Ben Zek, my colleague at Feng Jiang's lab. And he, he found that the CPF1 can process array itself so that we leverage this to generate high throughput library for double knockout screens. And we have, by the way, we first test the single gene pairs, P, P10 and NF1, and we swap the position of NF1, P10, and P10, NF1, and both work very well. So then we decided the position probably doesn't matter. So, and then we went to the metastasis genomics, which is the patient's metastases being sequenced by the Michigan uh, hospital. And we also took the literature curated metastasis genes, and then we make a metastasis driver candidate gene set and we computationally calculated all the uh, possible gene pairs of all those genes. And then we designed four, guide, four CRRNAs for each gene. And then our synthesized array would target 16 combinations for 225 gene pairs. That's 5,000 arrays. And we also, for single genes, we have 208 single knockouts for the 26 genes times uh, plus the neutral controls, which target two null sites, which means they don't create mutagenesis. So we, we have the double neutral, single knockout, and double knockout, all in the same array. And what we did is we synthesized an array of 11,934 features that have the double knockout, single knockout, NTC, NTC, neutral, double neutral. And what we did is we put this into the antiviral library, and then we use this library to double mutagenize the cancer cells that are CPF1 positive that we introduced. So these double mutant cell pools were injected into the animal and then we look for how the metastasis happened and which of the double mutant are enriched in the metastatic clones. And because this is high throughput, we can at one shot sequence read out everything together, including a plasmid, the cell pools, and the primary tumors and the metastases at all of all the, 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 the four lobes, as well as any other metastasis we can detect. So as you can see, each dot would represent one gene pair. If they're blue, they, this means this gene pair is a double knockout. If they're green, that, this means it's a single knockout. If they're red, then it's, it's double neutral. So the double neutral, the red dots represent the baseline of how a random double mutagenesis would behave, or how a random cell would behave. And then the green dots are how the single gene would behave and the blue dots are how the double knockouts behave. And if we look at each of the different lobe, we found two different patterns. One is the monoclonal spread, where your primary tumor have quite a few different clones, but only one dominant clone can be able to spread into the, the, uh, the, all the four, four lung lobes. But the second type, which is called the uh, polyclonal spread, where each of the, the metastases is dominated by different a genetic compositions like different double knockouts or single knockouts. And then we have to rely on a strong, like a lot of statistics to look for how each of those double knockouts compare to the single knockout. And for example, the how does NF2 single knockout compare to the NF2 trim 72 double knockout? And then we also fall back on the TCJ pan cancer and the, the Michigan metastasis patient mutation data, and then what we found is uh, quite a few interesting gene pairs like JAK1, KMT2C, that not only found in our screen, but also found to be mu mutated in the metastases of the patients. So uh, likewise, we constructed a metastasis interaction map, which is indicated the strength of how two genes interact in terms of driving metastasis in vivo. And, but how are these, interactions really driving metastasis are these two. And we decide to just test ourselves again by making just one gene pairs knockout, double knockout. So we knock out NF2 trim 72 and the NF2 trim 72 pair in both positions. So in uh, either as a trim 72 NF2 or NF2 trim 72. And we are able to generate those mutations efficiently uh, in one shot. And what we found is that this double mutations, uh, those double mutants do not change the ability of cells to, to grow, but it did change the cell's ability to migrate transfer. And as well as the most important one is the in vivo validation, meaning knocking out both genes in D dry metastasis much faster than knocking out single gene alone. So in the patient, if uh, the, the patient's mutations have those two, then it would be, uh, it would be a poor signature for our survival. 
So, and then at the final several minutes of the talk, I'd like to turn ourselves to the, uh, the current immunotherapy uh, regimen. And the, the first experiment we did for trying to tackle immunotherapy is that we would like to tackle T cells because T cells are the powerful killer of cancer cells. But how can we engineer T cells so that we can modify T cells and turn them into our flavor to fight cancer cells? And we decided to leverage the CPF1 system and develop a viral plus non-viral combination platform that's really flexible for us to be for us to highly efficiently engineer T cells. We call it Kiko T cell for knock in and knock out simultaneously. And then, for example, uh, we first tested the ABAV CPF1's ability to knock out two genes simultaneously using a single array. So this is single array knocking out track and knocking out PD1. And we're able to use the uh, one single AAV to, to generate mutation frequency at uh, close to 80%. And how about we create a knock in and a knock out? So in this case, we keep the array of track and PD1 double and then, but we also provide a donor that introduces the C22 CAR T driven by EFS promoter and then flanked by the track locus homology arms. So when CPF1's array opens the, the, gen, the genomic region of track, and this would slide in via homologous, homologous recombination. So in one infection, we're able to achieve 45% of the knock in, and of course, and when we look, all these knock, most of these knock-ins have PD-1 knockout. So it's a one-step process of creating a car with the second gene being knocked out. And what are the characteristics? So these cells, in fact, can grow like crazy. And even though we, uh, our initial efficiency was like 40%, and as we keep culturing those because the mutant cells lose DCR, the, the CAR T cells are able to stimulate themselves and have a growth advantage. So by day nine, which is a week and a half, this reached close to 75%. And then in almost all of these cells, they are PD-1 mutant. This is a 90 to 95% efficiency of P1 knockout. And how about we try to knock in two constructs, like for example, a car and plus something else or two car. And we tried to use Cas9 to begin with, but those gave us a very poor efficiency, like a few percent. And then we turned into the CPF1 system, which allow us to generate pretty efficiently at the, for example, at 25% of the double knock-in. This is, uh, so all of these T cells have the CAR19, CAR22, meaning C19, C22 specific, double specific CAR. And those can keep growing themselves as well. Like within two weeks, this can grow to 60% of the double knock-in. And as we keep culturing them, this grow to 80% or more. We didn't just didn't show the data here. And we tried the other guide RNAs as well, and we, we confirmed this is independent of the guide RNA, so suggesting this is a platform-specific effect. And what we later on, using the flow and other assays to characterize these cells, we found that the, the, uh, the, the double knock, the car, tickle car have lower exhaustion compared to the Cas9 car. And we'll just show, go straight to the statistics where the Cas9 car have uh, quite a bit of P1 uh, and digit expression and uh, to some degree lag three and the Kiko car can reduce this to uh, reduce level P1 to almost zero because it knocks it out, even though the Cas9 also knocks it out, but it's not as complete as this. And then also Tiju was brought down to about threefold and also lag three was brought down twofold for these car Ts. And with the, this is happening without compromising or without sacrificing interferon gamma and TNF alpha production, which are the two key cytokines for these T cells. So in summary, I would like to uh, wrap up what we talked about today is that we have the ways of high throughput mapping of truly functional drivers from the, the native cells in the native tumor microenvironment in immunocompetent mice. And that can be done in the in vivo screen manner uh, for us to discover therapeutically relevant target in the future. And we can do this in both coding and non-coding elements, and we can knock out two genes at the same time to study the genetic interactions. And then and finally, a new approach of engineering uh, T cells so that we can build better and then potentially more uh, efficacious and uh, safer CAR Ts in the, in the future. 
So that's what we hope to achieve in the future or can be done in the future is that we can extend the FCGA or functional cancer genome atlas concept to other hallmarks of cancer, for example, the not just transformation metastasis, but more importantly, drug resistance and immune invasion, and then possibly metabolic programming. And we can achieve this at a single cell level. And now we're trying to do the perturb seq where we can actually uh, perturb and single cell sequence them. And uh, finally, we were hoping to identify key drivers for cancer immunity and, and have better therapeutic targeting. And uh, so, and finally, I'd like to thank the lab and the funding, a lot of colleagues, including uh, Marcus, who is sitting in the audience, and, uh, and, and other colleagues in my department, and, and your attention. Thank you very much. Well, that was a lot. Um, so, uh, questions from the audience? I can come up with one if folks are uh, thinking for a little bit. Um, Just a shout out, I'll repeat it. Okay, well, the metastasis studies you had, you were seeing one mouse, I think you called it mouse one, yeah. and it was a single clone right. that predominated the metastasis. Yeah. Is that called a major? within the tumor, or was that a minor clone that was just more metastatically oriented than other clones? Uh, wait, yeah, yeah that's a great question. It is actually a dominant clone. Yeah. Not dominant. Right, yeah. Oh, well, it, it's like 40%, and then this is the one that spread to all five lobes. Yeah. So it, in the, now these, the other mouse, they had a baseline mutation that you we're looking at it, for example, that one, right? Are those other mutations, do those tend to grow more aggressive tumors, and that's why they spread, or are they just two unrelated things? Like one would be a driver mutation that mm. caused a lot of growth, but not necessarily caused a lot of attack. Oh, that's a great question. In general, the pattern is the more aggressive you grow, the more likely it metastasizes. This is true from dated back from the 80s with Hellman and Hyman's uh, famous paper on breast cancer. And later on, we did the whole genome scale screen also confirming the pattern. But of course, there are outliers like the genes that didn't make the cancer grow fast, but still can metastasize very fast. And we have those outliers as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, I guess a sort of related question. This is more in your uh, synergistic, yeah. uh, well, actually, your your screen for looking at escapers from immu like immune evasion things. And you had NF2, yeah. TSE1, a number a number of those hits are clearly tumor suppressors. Yeah. Yeah. And there might be a confounding effect of the tumor growing out a little bit faster, which is one of the reasons possibly for overrepresentation. I don't know if you have thoughts about about that at all. Right. And that's a great question. And in fact, that's why we validate twice. We first see if it outgrows the mute mice, and then we later on see if it outgrows the B6 mice, which has everything. And right. then we narrow down to one. And uh, Diane. Thanks so much. That went really fast. Yeah. What was your rationale for choosing the AAV vectors? Uh, in terms of which cells they infect, the size of the insert you can put in, et cetera? It's a gene therapy friendly vector and it has few immune responses. And also, they, uh, we use AV9 and 6 and we compare and we later on figure out AV6 is a lot better and for infecting T cells. And also, if we put the DNA in, that could ca cause the innate immune responses for the T cell. But if you use AV as a carrier, you can dampen that effect. So quite a few different things. And you can use as a gene donor and a, a, a carrier for expressing guy RNA, uh, plus all those two, uh, the other features. But of course, the downside is that it's harder to make. So that's a cost issue. Yeah. In the earlier part of the talk, too, you had beta-2 microglobulin coming up as a cancer hit. I think that was a little surprising. Any thoughts about yeah. that? So I think the reason we hit B2M is likely due to immune pressure because the, the immune cells keep surveying the, the tumor microenvironment 
And if we do that in the immunodeficient mice, we don't see it. But if we do it in the fully immunocompetent, like Cas9 transgenic, and that we saw B2M. So. And, and this was mostly the glio, was that the glioblastoma? Right, right? glioblastoma. Yeah. And, and so something to keep in mind too, and this is also for other folks who might be thinking about this, um, things like nude and rag mice actually still have NK cells. And in other people's screens, yeah. beta 2M tends to drop out rather than be enhanced. Mm -hmm because of NK activity, and I don't really know offhand what NK activity is in, in the CNS, but that may be low right. endogenously for reasons that, that folks don't understand. Right. Uh, any other questions? All right. I'm curious if you can comment about the choice for your CAR T cells in knocking out PD-1. Is that to try and enhance uh, efficacy in, in solid tumors? Or the construct looked like it was directed at uh, blood cancers. Right. And are you concerned at all that that might increase the risk of autoimmunity? Right. Great question. And actually, the choice of PD-1 is just for, for a proof of principle. That, and also, we, we know the T cells can become exhausted in vivo, and that can help decreasing the T cell exhaustion uh, potentially. We haven't done a lot of uh, in vivo work to see how they behave in, in vivo yet. But given that the technology can basically knock in and knock out virtually any gene your choice, we can pick other genes, yeah. Super, any other questions? All right. Oh, this is not a knockout. This is a knock in, and and the efficiency in our hands is better if you're trying to knock in two rather than one. We compare the single gene knock in, we don't see any difference in the knock in efficiency. And but if we do multiple, meaning make it complicated, then this seems to be the better strategy. Yes. Alrighty. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks very much, City. Thank you, Michael. And Chavi. Thank you all.